Uh, we're pleased today to have uh, Professor Steve Gervin from the Yale Quantum Institute and Co-Design Center for Quantum Advantage at Brookhaven National Laboratory uh, here to speak with us today. I think we'll hear uh, potentially a little bit about the new uh, DOE Quantum Center that is being stood up, but most of the talk will be about uh, bosonic codes and quantum error correction in circuit QED, which I'm uh, very curious to hear about this exciting new work. So I wanna thank you for joining us and I'm looking forward to this talk. The one I wanna just highlight uh, briefly to, to uh, uh, the, the next speaker. Um, and I wanna just note the date change. The next meeting, uh, Dr. Ojas Parikh from Sandia National Laboratories will be talking on algorithmic advances in optimization and simulation. Uh, and the first Wednesday, which is normally when we have these meetings corresponds or conflicts with the QIP meeting. Uh, that's being held uh, virtually this year. And so, uh, and then OGIS had a conflict the following week. So it's being passed, pushed back to uh, two weeks from, from our normal times to just highlight that. But I'll be sending that out in, in, the, in the regular announcement that we have. So uh, without further ado, uh, Steve, I'll stop sharing and turn it over to you. And looking forward to this talk. Thank you for, uh, for speaking today. Okay, thank you for the invitation. And so um, I hope people will ask questions. I have a little trouble <laughs> multitasking and seeing if hands are being raised. So uh, either, you know, feel free to just interrupt. And uh, let's see, I need to turn on uh, my pointer. I'll monitor the chat as well if people okay, throw questions great. in there. And if I work hard, I can make this control disappear. Okay. All right, great. So um, thank you. So I'm going to uh, talk about bosonic codes, co error correcting codes, where the information is stored not in regular qubits, but in uh, superpositions of microwave photon states and resonators. And I also have a section at the end of the talk that I, on um, quantum simulations with bosons, which I probably won't have time to get to, but we'll see. Uh, so as Dave mentioned, I am uh, find myself being the director of one of the five uh, DOE uh, quantum information science research centers, the C2QA, which is uh, led by Brookhaven National Laboratory. It uh, comprises five federal labs and 18 universities. IBM is an industrial partner, uh, 88 PIs. And uh, so I'm <laughs> not quite sure how I got talked into this, but I'm having fun. And uh, we're, we're working uh, primarily on superconducting qubit uh, technologies and also transduction technologies between superconducting qubit frequency domains, microwaves, and uh, telecom wavelengths. So my take home message is that uh, bosons are great. Uh, they're <clears throat> both quantum error correction and quantum simulations of physical models containing bosons are vastly easier to do if your hardware contains bosonic degrees of freedom uh, natively. People are aware that fermions are hard to simulate because of all the minus signs. Uh, it turns out that bosons are hard to simulate with qubits, uh, not because of the, there are no minus signs, but you can have um, many bosons in a single mode. And that turns out to be um, uh, make that kind of simulation uh, difficult if, you, if you're using qubits. So, but, uh, so, so if you have two level systems, discrete variables, qubits, uh, and you have some number of them, then of course you get a Hilbert space uh, whose dimension is two to the number of qubits and you can make arbitrary quantum states out of those here in this example, eight states. Uh, but you could store the same quantum information, namely these complex coefficients, 
you could store them in a single harmonic oscillator by taking linear combinations of photon number Fox states. And you can, uh, this is a discrete system, but it has an infinite number of levels. And so uh, you can also talk about its wave function as, as you can talk about it as a continuous variable where the coordinate of the harmonic oscillator is say the electric field at this point in the a cavity. And there's a kind of one-to-one -one correspondence you could make between the discrete qubit states. If you just thought of these uh, numbers as binary numbers and you just map them onto photon numbers zero through seven, you would have a, a nice simple uh, equivalence between those degrees of freedom. But there will be great advantages in the fact that uh, the resonator is just a piece of vacuum surrounded by superconductor. And uh, if you want more states, you just use uh, more states in the oscillator, and you don't have to add more moving parts, more qubits, so to speak. So um, you could imagine building a hybrid architecture that has both discrete variables, qubits and continuous variables, oscillators. Uh, the original version of circuit QED, you might call discrete variable dominant. There are transmon qubits, the approximately two level systems uh, that communicate with each other by virtual photon exchange through a quantum bus or a, a passive um, uh, resonator. <clears throat> you could also uh, imagine, and this is what we're thinking about in the Yale group, um, uh, a new version of this in which it's sort of continuous variable dominant. There's an array of resonators or cavities, harmonic oscillators, bosonic modes, and those are controlled and coupled <clears throat> using the things that used to be the qubits, the, the transmons, uh, here treated as uh, uh, four-way, three and four-way mixers. So there are some benefits to using uh, bosonic encoding. If you store <coughs> um, uh, superpositions of uh, photon states in a cavity. Here you see some, some Wigner functions, uh, which I'll mention uh, a bit more later, of some uh, error corrected, correctable code words. Then you don't, if you want to transmit them somewhere else, they're already photons. You just have to open the door and let them uh, come out. And they're already in an error correcting code so that if there are errors during the uh, transmission, you can correct them at the, uh, at the other end. And uh, you can also transduce these error corrected words up to telecom frequencies and uh, transmit them perhaps over longer distances. And doing one way quantum communication and remote entanglement because the um, you're sending error correctable code words. And uh, so the, producing these kind of complicated linear combinations of small numbers of photons uh, is quite difficult uh, using standard nonlinear optics techniques in, in the optical region, but it's uh, relatively easy to do in microwave frequencies. So there are advantages to uh, being able to operate with superconducting qubits and then convert to telecom wavelengths and back down again. Okay, so uh, I guess uh, you guys are also working on error correction, so I don't have to tell you that it's very difficult. Uh, but the argument I want to make is that discrete variable error correction is particularly hard. Uh, and the reason is that uh, you make, you take n physical qubits to make your logical 
qubit, let's say nine physical qubits to make a short code uh, logical qubit. And you have some controller, some Maxwell demon error correction uh, circuit, which has to work very rapidly to identify which of, uh, let's say, the three Pali error types uh, occurred in which of the nine places. And so there are uh, three N, in this case, 27 possible single qubit errors. And you have to measure enough uh, high weight error syndromes to distinguish uh, which of these uh, 27 errors has occurred. And of course, the demon is made out of similar parts and makes its own mistakes, which is the further challenge of fault tolerance. So the idea I want to talk to you about is to not use material objects at all as the qubits, but use the microwave photon states stored in high Q superconducting resonators. And I'll try to explain some of the benefits of that. But uh, to date, uh, uh, only these uh, bosonic codes have uh, come close to or slightly exceeded the break-even point where applying the uh, error, using the error correction encoding and applying the error correction circuit actually makes things better instead of worse. Uh, and uh, there's a couple of recent re uh, reviews on the archive uh, about bosonic codes that you might be interested in and a number of theory and experimental papers listed here. I'm happy to share my slides later if anybody wants them. So, um, so uh, microwave resonators are very simple. They're empty boxes surrounded by superconducting walls. And uh, the more vacuum and the less surface, uh, the, the, the better they are. Vacuum is a very low loss uh, dielectric. And uh, there's a kind of hardware efficiency associated with the fact that this single object has uh, a tower of quantum levels, and you can replace several qubits by just using more levels uh, in this object. So there are fewer moving parts. You don't have to add more moving parts uh, to get to um, higher numbers of levels. And furthermore, <clears throat> the error syndrome, the error model is very simple. There's a single quantum mode and it loses quanta due to weak damping. And it does so more slowly than transmon qubits. Uh, it, uh, you can make extremely high Q resonators. So the combination of having uh, fewer types of errors and uh, uh, more rare errors uh, makes this a, um, uh, an attractive system. So it turns out you can imagine two kinds of errors, energy loss and uh, frequency fluctuations. But the frequency fluctuations are quite small. They're, you know, they're just determined by the geometry of the box, and the frequency is very stable. Um, so you can imagine making a bosonic code that consists of some code word zero, that's some linear combination of microwave states, and a code word one, which is some orthogonal linear combination, and get a logical qubit. And uh, we like to use code words that have definite photon number parity, let's say even, that, that these code words are made only of even photon numbers. And uh, since there's only a single dominant error, which is photon loss, then, and since these are eigenstates of parity, then you only need a single stabilizer to measure, namely the photon number parity. If you lose a photon, obviously the parity changes from even to odd. And if you lose another one, it comes back to even. 
So uh, an example of such a code is this uh, binomial code, which uh, error um, code word zero is a linear superposition of zero photons and four photons. And code word one is two photons. So you can see it's only made of even code words. It's an eigenstate of the eigenvalue plus one of the parity. And if I lost a photon, uh, it, the parity would become odd, and I would know that an error had occurred. And unlike uh, traditional quantum optics, it's actually relatively easy to make a quantum non-demolition measurement with high fidelity of the photon number parity using the uh, control techniques that we have in circuit QED. So, um, here is this uh, simplest member of the so-called family of binomial codes. It uses photon states zero through four, so just uh, 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 five total states or the equivalent of log two of five uh, bits. And uh, if I lose a photon, well, that the uh, photon destruction operator applied to this word gives me square root of two times three, and applied to this word gives me square root of two times one. It's very important that both of these amplitudes have a root two in them. That's just a reflection of the fact that both of these code words have, on average, two photons, the same photon number. And so if one code word had many more photons than the other, then there would be a bias. And when you see a photon loss, you would say, oh, it's more likely to have been in the state with more photons. So there would be a Bayesian update or a quantum back action. So uh, I can be, uh, recover from such an error if I can find a unitary transformation that will take this error state three back to where it came from, which was zero plus four, and take this error state back to where it came from, which is two. And because the two error states are orthogonal and the two original code words are orthogonal, there exists a unitary that will do that job. So you uh, you might it uh, it's a tricky unitary. You know, you start with three and you either have to subtract three photons or add one in superposition, but it's possible to do this. You might think, well, that's it. The only error is losing a photon. But I'll remind you that uh, if you think about the, um, the Krauss jump operators that would appear in the um, master equation, you can, you can lose a photon. You can have a jump event where, let's say, some detector detects out in the environment that the photon was emitted. Or you can have a no jump event, and that when nothing happens, when no photon is lost, you might say to yourself, oh, uh, nothing happened to the quantum state. But that's actually not true. If you wait a while and you don't see any clicks of your detector, then you have to lower the, there's a, uh, the, the, your estimate of the quantum amplitude that you're in one of the larger photon number states because uh, you didn't see any clicks. The dog did not bark in the night, if you uh, know the Sherlock Holmes story. So the combination of what happens with jumps and no jumps is, uh, you have to take those both into account. And what happens under no jump? Well, it turns out that nothing happens to this state. It's an eigenstate of number. And uh, nothing happens to it when you, I mean, it gets multiplied by some uh, factor, but uh, this state also gets multiplied by that same factor. So nothing happens when you normalize them again. But this state is changed because the amplitude to be in four has to be slightly reduced and the amplitude to be in zero has to be slightly increased. And to first order in the damping rate of the 
oscillator times the small time interval we're talking about. This corresponds to a unitary rotation that rotates 0 plus 4 slightly towards 0 minus 4. So then you get, you know, the coefficient of 0 gets a little bigger and the coefficient of 4 gets a little smaller. Coefficient of 2 stays the same. Uh, but again, that's a unitary rotation. And so if you see no jump, you can also correct that. Any questions so far? OK. So, um, so uh, we want to understand where, you know, we can do these correction unitaries and uh, for the jump and the no jump, but of course not perfectly, and we sometimes make mistakes. So we want to understand how to define a break-even point for bosonic code. So the break-even point for um, logical or an error correcting code made of qubits is, let's say you have your nine physical qubits uh, and you take the very best one that's in your short code uh, logical qubit and you say, how long does the information live if I just use that one physical qubit? Then you have the nine physical qubits, the errors are happening at least nine times faster now but your error correction code, hopefully you're applying the error correction, overcomes that factor of nine and gets you back to where you started. That's the break even point. I, ideally, you'll get well beyond that. So what's the analog of that for Poisonic codes? Well, we've chosen to say that the best what you have to do is beat the best uncorrectable Poisonic code, which is just the two states of the uh, oscillator with the smallest photon number, zero and one, if you do a superposition of those, that is going to live the longest possible time because the rate of losing photons is proportional to how many photons you have. So I'm going to use a code now. Here's a code that has two photons on average. Uh, so it has, it's going to have errors faster than this, but this has the advantage of being error correctable. And if my error correction is good enough, it will uh, cause the lifetime of the logical information to be longer than if it's in this code. And then you've exceeded the break even point. So here's an experiment from the Lu Yan Sun group, is a former postdoc of Rob Sholkoff's now, has a very excellent uh, and active group in Tsinghua in China. And it reaches 92% of the break even points. So here you see uh, storing the information in the transmon, and it decays rather quickly in 38 microseconds. Then um, you put the uh, information into the cavity using this uh, binomial code, and you see it lasts um, about 71 microseconds. So we're doing uh, nearly a factor of two better, but that's not quantum error correction. That's just using a better quantum system with a longer lifetime. And then when you turn on the error correction um, uh, protocol, the lifetime jumps up to 200 microseconds. So now you're doing even better. Uh, but just using this code with zero and one photons, the lifetime is 216 microseconds. So it's not quite reaching break even, but it's becoming very close. Um, so let's, this was not the, the first Bosonic code. I'll come to that later and, and one that actually did exceed break even. But this is an interesting one. And you can do a head to head comparison of two codes that correct amplitude damping the binomial code I just described for you, and the uh, uh, Lung and uh, 
Chuang and the Yamamoto code from 1997 with four physical qubits. You might remember that five is the smallest number of qubits to make a logical qubit that can correct any single qubit error. But if you only have amplitude damping, qubits falling from the excited state to the ground state, then you only need four, okay? So both of these codes are designed to de fix the same thing, amplitude damping, and we can therefore do a head-to-head -head comparison of their performance. And they have some beautiful, uh, you know, sort of parallels. So here is the four qubit amplitude damping code. Uh, the qubit states are 1100 and 0011 and so forth. And you see uh, that's analogous to my uh, binomial code state that has two excitations. And this qubit state is analogous to my superposition of zero and four excitations. But this is for the cavity, and this is for the four qubits. I just need photon number parity stabilizer measurements here, which we can do with 99.8% uh, QND. That is, we can do it approximately 500 times before we wreck the parity uh, by, the, by making a mistake in the measurement. Uh, the actual um, getting the value of the parity correct uh, is uh, maybe 98.5, I think, or 98% accurate. Uh, and over here, you need multiple uh, 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 air, uh, stabilizers, some of which are rather high weight, in order to locate which of the four qubits has um, has decayed. So you can see that's where you have to work harder. Uh, the jump operators for there's the no jump operator. Uh, here n is the number of excitations that are photons. Here's the number of excitations that are excited qubits. And then you have one single excitation loss operator. Here you have four different ones. So you have to work harder. And uh, so the fact that the qubit code has four distinct places where the error can occur and the oscillator only has one is a big advantage. And uh, these qubit, uh, these stabilizer measurements require ancillaries and con multiple control not gates. Um, and they're, um, uh, tricky to do uh, these, even with uh, current ability with making two qubit gates today, it's still um, hard to do this in a good, uh, highly accurate and quantum non demolition way. Whereas this photon number parity is relatively easy. So now I'll go back to the original, the first uh, bosonic code experiment, which was from the Sholkoff group now four years ago, based on the Schrodinger cat code. So in this code, you have superpositions of coherent states. Uh, so just displacing the oscillator in phase space by some amount alpha alpha squared is the average photon number in the state. And the oscillator in some sense is in two places at once. It's at plus alpha and minus alpha. So that's one code word. And then this other code word is that it's the oscillator is at the origin, but at two different momenta, uh, I alpha and minus I alpha. So these plots of Wigner functions are, these are phase space plots. This axis is position of the oscillator. This axis is momentum of the oscillator. You can think of it as electric and magnetic field if you want. And uh, these states, because of these plus signs here, uh, are actually eigenstates of photon number parity. And furthermore, there's a very nice feature that coherent states themselves are eigenstates of the photon destruction operator. So uh, the, uh, th that turns out to make uh, 
you, you can kind of keep track of the photon losses. You don't have to correct them on the spot, it turns out. So, um, so in this experiment, here again is the lousy transmon controller. It only had a lifetime of 15 microseconds to hold the information. When you transfer the information from the transmon to the um, cavity, the lifetime goes up uh, an order of magnitude in this case. If you turn on, uh, so this is the, the cat code, but without doing the correction, when you turn on the correction, that's the red curve, the lifetime jumps up to uh, 320 uh, microseconds. And that's actually slightly longer than the uh, lifetime of the cavity, the, the lifetime you would get uh, by using just zero and one photon states for encoding. So it slightly exceeds the break-even point. And it turns out that this uh, error correction protocol heralds uh, if something goes wrong, because uh, at the end of the protocol, uh, to read out the information, we put it back in the transmon, and the cavity is supposed to be empty. If it's not empty, then there's almost certainly an error occurred in the process. So if we throw out the cases where that error flag went up, which is about 20% of the time, then we find the lifetime has extended to 560 microseconds substantially above the uh, break-even point by a factor of about 1.75. And it's not completely cheating because error correction schemes that put up a flag when they fail turn out to be uh, pretty efficient if you um, concatenate them with other uh, qubits and uh, logical qubits. And so uh, that's, a, that's a, a meaningful and useful number to know about. But still, we would like, keeping all the data, we would like to go not just 10% over break even, but one or two orders of magnitude. So it's still, we have a long way to go, but this is the first uh, experiment in any technology, ion traps or cold atoms or uh, uh, MB centers or whatever that's actually uh, beaten the break-even point. Um, okay, so there's some other interesting things. You don't have to measure uh, error syndromes and then make a decision and send pulses down to correct those errors. You can have autonomous error correction in which you engineer a quantum bath with special noise properties that sort of autonomously cools like a Maxwell demon. It autonomously uh, takes the entropy out of your logical qubit. And um, this experiment uh, by Chen Wang at UMass Amherst, another uh, former postdoc from our group, uses this so-called T4C truncated cat code. That's a superposition of two odd photon numbers is one code word, and a superposition of uh, two more odd numbers is the other code word with some funny coefficients here. And uh, by I'm not going to explain this very complicated diagram, but there's all kinds of uh, Rabi drives and complicated uh, driving si uh, sideband transitions and things that are turned on, but you just set them and forget them. And they um, uh, ultimately, uh, if an error occurs, you get driven back to the non-error state and a photon gets emitted into a low Q uh, bath oscillator. And the frequency of that photon gives you no information about which error occurred. So you, you erase you, you, the which path information about what error occurred. And in the end, the whole dynamics is described by this operator here, jump operator, which 
just adds one photon. If you're in zero, you go to one. If you're in two, you go to three, four to five, six to seven. And uh, well, a dagger would do that, but a dagger would come with square roots of n plus one matrix elements. And you want to get all the matrix elements to be equal in this case. And it turns out uh, that by clever uh, <laughs> control of all these multiple drives, uh, which I won't explain, uh, it's possible to, um, to achieve that goal. And there, so you just turn on these pumps and, and uh, the, the system starts automatically correcting without you having to have a FPGA systems and communication up and down from the cold temperatures to the computer. And this, uh, this system reached about 65% of, of uh, break even. The, the code by itself without correction in the cavity lasted 130 microseconds. It went up to 288 when you turn on the autonomous error correction. Uh, but the cavity itself uh, was still longer lived using, you know, if you use this zero one code. So still uh, close, but doesn't quite reach break even. Um, there's another line of work going on uh, at Yale in uh, Michelle Devere's group with uh, GKP states, uh, Gottesman Kataya Presco states, and uh, some really nice work in ion traps from the Jonathan Home group at uh, ETH. And uh, the GKP code words, this is phase space again. And uh, you, you put, it's like having a Schrodinger cat that's in 35 places at once uh, <laughs> in phase space. And, uh, um, you know, these codes were invented by theorists uh, 20 years ago. And uh, it seemed crazy, uh, theoretical idea nobody could ever build. But uh, recent experimental progress has made this look actually quite uh, promising. And uh, here's a magic state uh, production for those of you that are familiar with. Uh, it's not magic state distillation, but this is the resource that you would then distill. And the nice thing about these codes is that this, the errors are displacements and both the stabilizers and the gates are simple displacements of the oscillator in phase space, which are very easy to do. Uh, finally, I'll, I'll mention some uh, novel biased noise qubits. It would be nice to have qubits which don't suffer from depolarizing channels, that is where z, x, and y errors are all equally probable, it would be useful if uh, maybe uh, uh, one, uh, let's say the energy relaxation, the T1 time, is very, very long. And most of the errors are simply dephasing. That would simplify your life in terms of error correction. And by taking a, a, a transmon qubit, which is a kind of anharmonic oscillator, and applying two photon drives to it, it's possible to dynamically turn on a kind of double well potential in which the system can be sitting here or here. And because you're driving two photons at a time, you end up spontaneously getting Schrodinger cat states, uh, and um, which are superpositions of being here and here. And these can be used as qubits. And uh, my uh, Shruti Puri, who's a new assistant professor in our group, has been making great mileage out of um, uh, thinking about the fault tolerance of a quantum error correction code in which the noise is highly biased. So here, there's a kind of large barrier that sits between this state and that state. And so uh, if you call this pseudo spin up and this pseudo spin down, bit flips are very unlikely. The T1 time is very long. 
But phase flips, so what is a phase flip? Well, think about a coherent superposition of this and that. That's a, that's a cat state with even parity. And that's like pointing in the X direction on the block sphere. And here, if you accidentally lose a photon, you change the parity. And that turns out to flip you. It's like a phase error. It flips you from being at the X point on the block sphere to, to minus X. So this is a bias noise qubit in which uh, the noise is primarily acting uh, in the xy plane and not, well, okay, sorry, uh, primarily uh, causing dephasing, uh, that is it couples to sigma z, but z is a constant of the motion, the t1 is long. And uh, I guess I, okay, that's what I just said. And, um, so having that bias noise is helpful, but it turns out there's a no-go theorem that says it's not that helpful because as soon as you do a C naught gate, or uh, for example, um, you destroy the, the bias. If, if there's a, um, a noise event in the middle of doing a controlled NOT gate, uh, it turns out it sends errors. Um, it, it doesn't, it creates, um, X and Y errors, not just Z errors. But Shruti found a, a, a way to beat that no-go theorem by recognizing that these uh, sort of uh, Kerr cat states are actually part of an infinite family of uh, cat states because you can change the phase of the two photon driving and slowly move this cat around in phase space. And if you move it through angle pi, you're back to the same uh, encoding except for a not operation. And so you can continuously do a single qubit not operation by just deterministically shifting the uh, phase of the pump. And you never, you kind of go around the mountain in the middle, you don't, uh, you don't, uh, tunnel through it. And uh, by a more complicated version of that, you can do a controlled knot gate, which preserves uh, this noise uh, bias and therefore um, enhances the fault tolerance threshold that uh, Alaferis and Preskill found by uh, uh, factors of three to five, I think. That's really the first uh, advance in that kind of improvement of fault tolerance threshold in about 10 years. Um, and so uh, Michelle Deveray is has built such qubits and is now trying to work on the, uh, the controlled knot operation. Um, he's seen the noise bias that's working, but hasn't yet um, achieved the control knot operation. So that's forthcoming, we hope. Uh, and it turns out you can then take these funny qubits and assemble them into a surface code. And there's been a lot of progress actually on the surface code, modifying some of the, the details rather than having XX, XX and Z, 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 Z stabilizers. You can make a uh, code that just has X, Z, X, Z stabilizers uh, sitting on each uh, plaquette like that. And that code does better than the regular surface code. And when you add this noise bias, it does much better. And uh, you can achieve a, um, not a code capacity, but a true fault tolerance threshold of around 6%, uh, which is uh, according to uh, this uh, work that Shruti has in uh, preparation now. So that, that looks extremely uh, interesting and provides strong motivation for, for working on these bias noise qubits. So, uh, you know, the center that I'm running uh, is trying to, uh, you know, deal with some of the grand challenges in the field and uh, true fault tolerance is an extremely important grand challenge. If we don't figure out a way to dramatically extend the lifetime without requiring huge amounts of <laughs> huge numbers of physical qubits to make logical qubits, we're going to have the field is going to have a problem. 
And uh, so I've told you about <clears throat> two possible routes to that goal, uh, bosonic codes. And there the challenge is learning how to control beautiful microwave resonators with less beautiful controllers, transmons. And, um, and then there's this other related route with noise bias qubits and noise adapted error correction codes. Uh, so here, and so now I'll, I'll, I described some experiments, but I didn't really tell you how they worked. How do we achieve this quantum control and measurement of these hybrid discrete variable continuous variable systems? So here is the Hamiltonian that we uh, uh, approximate Hamiltonian for a transmon qubit inside a cavity. And the transmon has its own antenna and it talks to the microwave photons. And if you detune the transmon from the microwave cavity frequency, then the dipole coupling you know, is rapidly rotating. It doesn't conserve energy. And so the photon can jump in and then has to quickly jump out or vice versa. And so you, in second order, you get uh, the following Hamiltonian. There's a harmonic oscillator, which is just the uh, photons. There's an approximately two-level system, which is the transmon qubit. And then there's this dispersive coupling between them. That's uh, in second order perturbation theory describes the virtual uh, hopping of photons into the transmon and out again, or excitations of the transmon turning into a photon and jumping back. And it's chi, some dispersive shift, sigma z that tells you the state of the qubit, and then a dagger a it tells you how many photons are in the cavity. So this Hamiltonian commutes with sigma z and the photon number, uh, but yeah, and yet they're coupled together. And the fact that that commutes means we're going to be able to make quantum non-demolition measurements of the state of the qubit and the state of the cavity using this coupling. Uh, but we don't want these to be constants of the motion all the time. We have to create interesting states. So we turn on a cavity drive, which couples to the electric field in the cavity and changes the photon number. And we also turn on a drive, not at the cavity frequency, but at the qubit frequency so that we can Robbie flop the uh, qubit. And between this and the drive Hamiltonian, you can show that you have provable uh, universal control. And this coupling does interesting things. Uh, it it uh, shifts the frequency of the qubit depending on the number of photons, and it shifts the frequency of the cavity depending on the state of the qubit. And so you can do um, uh, readily do operations that entangle the two. So here's an example of the universal control that you can achieve. You can, if I just have a resonator and I apply a drive, the only thing I can make is a coherent state. I can just start the oscillator ringing, uh, but that's a kind of quasi classical state. If I wanna make an arbitrary Fox state, I need something anharmonic. I need a transmon controller, which is sitting over here. And uh, so here you see a uh, drive, to a numerically predicted uh, drive tone with two quadratures, I and Q, at, some, at the transmon frequency. And here you see a numerically predicted a drive you should apply to the resonator at the same time. And uh, based on the Hamiltonian, we, this was found by a uh, grape, by, you know, numerically. Uh, and this is the result. As a function of time, the cavity starts in state zero, qubit is in the transmon is in the ground state. It, uh, the cavity starts to get excited, crazy things are happening. And then there's some interference effect at the last uh, moment. Um, you end up exactly with all the amplitude in the n equals six state. Here you see the photon number distribution that we measure using that Hamiltonian. And here you see the Wigner function, uh, which is measured for the state of the cavity. And again, this is a quasi probability distribution in position and momentum. 
and you see that it's perfectly circularly symmetric. That's just the number phase uncertainty. The number is exactly known. So the phase has to be uncertain by two, uh, you know, completely uncertain, has to be circularly symmetric. So we can both prepare the state and do tomography to confirm that we've prepared the correct state. And those you know, this is just an example of the kind of quantum control and measurement that's used uh, to do the error correction I described earlier. So now I'll go into more detail about that was control. I'll go into more detail about the uh, the measurements. So um, you could ask the question: Is the photon number equal to one? Yes or no? Or is it equal to thirteen? Yes or no? And uh, in one recent experiment with two cavities, there were 256 possible photon numbers. So if you just pick, you know, one question, like it's like playing 20 questions with a <laughs> with a young child, and instead of saying they saying, you know, is it uh, is it an animal? They say, is it a left-handed uh, gray hippopotamus? Right. <laughs> so most of the time, the specific question you ask, the answer will be no. So this is very inefficient. And I'll show you a more efficient scheme shortly. But the quantum circuit that does this is just uh, a unitary that uh, flips the qubit, makes a pi pulse on the qubit, if and only if there are exactly m photons in the cavity. So it's a controlled unitary. Then I measure, did the qubit flip? If yes, then there were m photons in the cavity, and the state collapses to m. If no, then there were not m photons, and the state collapses to 1, you know, 1 minus this. And the way that unitary works is because the dispersive Hamiltonian shifts the frequency of the qubit by uh, 2 chi every time you add a photon. So if I apply a pi pulse at this frequency, it will be on resonance with the qubit if and only if there is exactly one photon in the cavity, or if I apply it here, exactly three. I could ask the question, a better question, is the photon number one or three, yes or no? Well, I just apply tones at both frequencies. And if the qubit flips, then the photon number was either one or three, but I don't know which. And in fact, I can measure any arbitrary binary function of the photon number. Uh, I, can, uh, I can just have a pick out a set of projectors weighted by these this binary vector, which is either 0 or, or 1. So I could, for example, ask, is the photon number odd by doing 1, 3, 5, and 7? And uh, uh, in fact, you can do a very efficient kind of binary search to find the photon number. So if, if I ask, is the photon number 13? It may or may not be. I don't learn that much information. But if I can sample from the photon number distribution, if I can do true boson sampling, I can uh, get information uh, exponentially faster. So I use this, uh, uh, this uh, ability to measure different binary valued functions of the photon number distribution to, to do the walsh hadamard transform of the, of the photon number distribution. So I first ask with this gate, is the photon number in the upper half or the lower half of the range of photon numbers I'm willing to consider? And then uh, the bit flips or doesn't flip depending on whether it's in the upper half or lower half. Then I ask uh, within the range that I've now narrowed it down to, but uh, is it in the upper half or the lower half of that? and so on down the line until the final question is what, is, what is the parity bit? Is it even or odd? And by combining all these measurement results, uh, I can determine the binary digits in the expression for the photon number that happened to be sampled that particular time. 
So this costs only log of the range of photon numbers I'm considering rather than being linear. So it's an exponential gain and it represents true efficient boson sampling. And we've used this uh, technique. I don't really have time to go into details, but I'll show you one spectrum uh, where you can map the spectrum, the optical spectrum of vibrating molecules onto the boson sampling problem. I will skip uh, all the details, but we represented the two kinds of vibration, stretch and bending of triatomic molecules by the number of microwave photons in each of two cavities. And we carried out some complicated uh, unitary transformation that maps you from one potential energy surface on which the uh, nuclei are vibrating to the next one when the, when the uh, photon comes in and breaks one of the chemical bonds. And uh, we are able to, um, uh, with rather high fidelity, uh, get the uh, spectrum. The solid line is the exact spectrum for our model Hamiltonian. The purple dots are the measured uh, samples from that spectrum. And the sampling infidelity was less than 5%. The distance between our distribution of results and the ideal one is less than 5%. This was an experiment carried out by Chris Wang and uh, Rob Sholkoff's group this past year. Uh, you can do this more efficient boson sampling where you, you uh, do the binary search. It requires a little more coherence for a longer time in the um, uh, transmon because you do those four measurements in a row in one shot. And uh, so the errors are, uh, a bit bigger, but it's 32 times faster. It's exponentially faster. And I just emphasize, so you know, this is hard to do with regular optics. We're, we've got we're finding out which of uh, uh, 256 possible photon states, um, uh, 16 in each of two cavities, you're in in a QND uh, single shot. Uh, sampling way, something that's pretty hard to do with traditional quantum optics. Um, and finally, um, you know, this does not, is not, an, of course, an example of boson sampling giving you quantum supremacy because we're comparing our results to the <laughs> exact calculations from a classical uh, computer. But it's interesting to point out that because the physical model has bosons in it, the mechanical vibrations of the molecule, uh, it's very efficient. We had a very simple apparatus with two resonators and three transmons and some auxiliary resonators. Uh, to do this simulation with a qubit system would have required eight qubits plus lots of ancillas and a circuit depth greater than a thousand. And so in some funny sense, we have demonstrated quantum supremacy over all existing qubit based quantum computers because they uh, you know, uh, can't, uh, can't do this level of circuit depth. So uh, the take home message is uh, again, that we like bosons and both quantum error correction and quantum simulations of physical models containing bosons are vastly more efficient if your hardware actually contains bosons. And I talked about both error correction and um, Frank Condon factor simulations. Uh, these experiments were done in uh, uh, Rob's lab by Chris Wang and Jacob Curtis. We talked to actual chemists. That was uh, useful and enlightening, and but difficult. We had to overcome various language barriers, but that was very uh, useful for the Frank Condon uh, experiments. And then the uh, GKP work is done in the Devray lab, and with whom uh, we also collaborate closely. So I'll stop there and uh, take your questions. Thank you very much, Steve. Uh, very interesting work. There was, uh, I know at least one from Will Zeng. Will, are you still on? You want to ask it? I, I actually had the exact same question. Ah, great. <laughs>
thanks for the talk, Steve. Um, it was actually about the uh, the Wang experiment on autonomous error correction that didn't reach yes. break even. And I was wondering if you could comment on what the limiting factor is that is keeping it from that. Um, so I haven't. Uh, so let's see. So uh, I don't know for sure <clears throat> the limiting factors. Typically, it's dominated by the transmon, which is you know. We have to have the transmon as a controller because otherwise we don't have universal control of the oscillator. And so the, the big challenge is we're using the oscillators because they're so much better than the transmon and yet we have to have the transmon still there in a secondary role. So learning how to fault tolerantly control a beautiful resonator with a less beautiful transmon is, is, is currently our dominant uh, problem. And I, I haven't, I don't recall the precise details in the experiment, but I think I can uh, confidently state that the transmon is the most likely uh, culprit. I had a, a maybe similar question. I, I think it was the, the thing you talked about first on the ozonic encoding. Um, how, I assume you can't prepare those states exactly. They actually may have been that experiment. Um, how much does state preparation error come into play? Uh, yeah, uh, so that's a <laughs> that's an interesting question. Uh, it's it's um, you know, I mean, the whole field suffers from the following problem: somebody optimizes all the parameters in an experiment to get something, you know, the some result that they're uh, like error correction they're trying to do. And those optimizations may, you know, be at the expense of uh, uh, being able to do good state preparation or something like that. So if you're really aiming for state preparation and less at being able to characterize or error correct, you can probably make these uh, states with uh, fidelities like the, the um, um, you know, 98% or something. In practice, trying to optimize other things you want to do once you've made the states, then uh, it can be 95% um, for these small uh, superpositions of different photon code words, or, or maybe you know even worse, depending on the, how good your transmon controller is. So, um, or and and the, and may so I should refer to those as spam errors. They may be more in the measurement uh, tomography than in the preparation. It's it's a complicated question, and the answer just depends on the particular experiment. But uh, uh, it is possible to make these small code words, you know, pretty well, but not uh, with three nines yet, for sure. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, any last really quick questions? I know we're a bit over time. Uh, Eugene, here, I'll ask one from Eugene, just a quick comment. Uh, uh, Eugene Dumitrescu from Oak Ridge. Can you comment on the scalability or current limiting factor for the vibron uh, vib vibronic spectra results? I think this is yeah. the last thing you showed. So, uh, so that's a good question. I mean, uh, you know, could we scale this up to, um, the uh, USTC level and try to try for uh, quantum supremacy. So right now, no. But the next gen, the first generation experiment had two oscillators and three transmon controllers and some and so on oscillators. The next generation experiment will be a three by three lattice containing nine oscillators that could be used for a nine mode molecule or a three by three. Uh, instantiation of the boson Hubbard model, for example. Um, and we'll see how much harder that is to uh, do, you know, with all the uh, additional channels of control and, and readout. Um, but that's the, that's the next step we're taking in the, in the scaling. Getting to 50 or 100 modes will take longer. <laughs> So the, the challenges are primarily um, uh, 
you know, especially at academic places is being able to control huge numbers of channels. Uh, we're getting involved with engineers to serious engineers to, to help us with that. Great. Well, thank you again, Steve, for a very enlightening talk, very interesting talk. I really appreciated it. So on behalf of everyone, well, thank you. And uh, looking forward to uh, our next talk in six weeks. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.